Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me this week are Jeff Renke and Anna Wells. We each have more than 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we take the five most popular stories on our websites and discuss the implications they have on our industry going forward. But before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach any one of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube at IEN Magazine so you can join us every Thursday when we go live. Jeff, how are you doing this week? I'm great, David. How are you? I'm doing great. Came in hot on that intro. Yeah. Pretty, I, pretty jazzed up. I do it like I sometimes like to be just like really subdued Okay. before. And then as soon as Eric counts down from to one, just yeah. like hit it. Just get there after it. Yeah. And then like hopefully if I startle somebody in the studio, I get even <laughs> like gives me even a little more juice. Um, so you go on like some sort of idle mode while you're standing here talking to us. And I do. It's like conserve uh, some energy. Yeah, it's kind of like a natural pre podcast flow state. And then you flip the switch and it's just like, hi. <laughs> Um, it's the David show. Yeah. As uh, producer Alex says, it's great for audio. My <laughs> levels are bananas. <laughs> really popping those peas. Right. Do I need, do I need that like a uh, pop filter or is that just something that we've resigned? They don't make a big enough one for me. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's always good to have the support of your producers. Hey, <laughs> Anna, how are you doing this week? Uh, good. Yeah, ready to go. All right. Well, before we jump into our first story this week, we have a word from our sponsors at Orkin. This week's episode is brought to you by Orkin. Do you feel like pests keep finding creative new ways into your facility? You're not imagining it. Even if you are careful about managing pests, these crafty creatures are always looking for holes in your defenses. So, download Exclusion Basics, your first line of defense against pets. Nope, not pets. Keep them in. Don't eradicate your pets. <laughs> your first line of defense against pests. It's a new guide that gives you the best exclusion practices to keep pests out of your facility. If you're unfamiliar, exclusion refers to repairing, sealing off, and shutting down common pest entry points. Download this new guide now and check out the six signs you might need exclusion surfaces. Uh, and a, one important thing, one important takeaway is that this guide will not tell you how to eliminate your or friends or loved ones' pets. Which is, I think, what's the great about this guide. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a really good guide. <laughs> it's pet friendly. Yeah, it's a pet friendly guide. Yeah. It's just, it's the guide that's like, hey, we all know that you were never a dog person. And here's how to make sure it stays that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our first story this week. Celebrity tequila stolen in a wild $1 million heist. Thieves targeted a major Santo spirit shipment as it crossed the border into the United States. The tequila company is co-owned by celebrity chef Guy Fieri and musician Sammy Hagar. A pair of Santo trucks carrying nearly 25,000 bottles or about $1 million in tequila were hijacked. The trucks had just crossed into Laredo, Texas, en route to distributors in California and Pennsylvania. Neither made it. Johansson, Santo's logistics partner, says things started looking fishy around November 9th. Santo's CEO, Dan Butkus, told Forbes that the drivers sent photos to dispatch saying they had broken down. The GPS information matched the driver's accounts, but once the drivers reached Laredo, the heist was on. Santo didn't know anything was happening until the, the distributors called. They wanted to know where their tequila was. But by then, the trucks were gone. Johansson said the loads had been illegally double brokered. Double brokering happens when a broker with a signed contract with a shipper passes that shipment to a different broker without letting the original shipper know. This second shipper allegedly spoofed the GPS signal that was used to track the shipments with a GPS emulator. Fieri says the company's Mexico-based distiller is working around the clock to replenish supply. Santo will still face shortages, which is unfortunate as Fieri says Santo was having its best year on record. 
One of the trucks was recently found in Los Angeles being offloaded in the street. The other truck might never be seen again. Jeff, are we likely to see similar heists as the tech like GPS emulators becomes more sophisticated? 100%. I mean, this is not going away. This is something that's been plaguing um, cargo haulers for a while. I mean, I saw a stat, something like an increase of 57% over the last three years in terms of the number of these hijacks that have taken place. And LA is the number one spot for them. So it makes you appreciate a lot of what's going on here in terms of food and beverage. That's the number one item that's typically stolen in these situations as well. So, and all this has an impact. It's not a victimless crime. All of these things, the costs associated with it and the losses get passed along the consumers. The other thing that I was thinking about with this, and this was a little bit more diabolical in terms of how they rerouted the truck to a fake warehouse and stole everything there and got it on a different truck. Um, But if you're a driver, and we know that there's a driver shortage right now for Mm -hmm. these types of situations, this also has to weigh into your thinking if you want to choose this as a career path. Mm -hmm. When we see the types of increases that are going on here, when we see, especially in this geography, Mexico can be tough, man. It is yeah. not a, a wonderful place to be a truck driver. There are a number of huge issues there. You're looking at almost 8,000 of these hijackings just in Mexico on an annual basis. <clears throat> Yikes. And we've seen people like Pepsi, Amazon, a lot of bigger companies, not just sort of a niche beverage producer like this, get hit with huge attacks. Mm-hmm. So it does. It's, it's something that needs to be addressed in some way, shape, or form because it's not going away. Some people would look at autonomous vehicles as a potential solution there. At least you're taking the human element out of it in terms of damage or potential harm to the drivers. But you can still steal an autonomous truck as well. So what the actual solution is here, I don't know. But we're going to be hearing more of this. And it's probably going to be on a much greater level than sort of just a tequila product. Which, I mean, you feel for everyone who's involved here. It's a million dollars in product. But it also sort of sets the stage for other things like this to take place. Yeah. Why Why so much food and beverage theft? What do you think it is about that market that draws people to it? Or is it kind of just anything they can get their hands on? Tough to trace. Yeah. Easy to sell. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I'm sure it's easy to move a lot of tequila. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that could be said, though, is at least when you think of traditional truck jacking, uh, for that matter, at least this is... <sighs> theoretically less violent because they're just rerouting it somewhere else. They drop it off and then kind of. No, the initial, at least the way I read this, the initial haulers really didn't have any idea, anything negative, anything Mm -hmm. was going on here. They just dropped it off at a warehouse like they were told to do. Yeah. And that's where it was stolen. So it's, you're right. In that instance, there wasn't any harm potential to the drivers, but this is going to get a ton of press. I mean, it's been covered all over the place. So again, if you're (laughs) looking to try to recruit truck drivers, these stories don't help. Well, no. If it is an autonomous car or an autonomous truck, I mean, that can just as easily. Yeah. Then you have one less element that you got to worry about if you're the uh, um, the thieves. And uh, if there's one thing that is certain now, it is that, as Jeff said, this story has been everywhere. Hey, at least everyone knows Santo Tequila now. That's true. There was... Um there was some promotion that probably came out of this. I personally went to their website to find mm-hmm. out a little bit more about the brand. And um, even I walked away kind of thinking, this is sort of a cool brand. Yeah, I um, want to try this. It, when they restock in January. Yeah, when when available. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, they talk on their website about how uh, they make this tequila with no additives, no colors. Um, they say that it's made in the way that tequila has been historically made in Mexico. So they use this old family method that's been around for 80 years where they slow roast the agave in a traditional stone oven. Um, So when you look at how they focus on the culture and the roots of the product and the the process, um, especially this premium version that was on the truck that took, I think, three and a half years to make. um, It's pretty sad, I think, for people who were working on this um, and producing all of all of it through their hard work. Uh, Santo says it will be um, unable to restock its products until next year. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the timing of this is very unfortunate. Um, you know, as the article lays out that this time of year is when people are kind of stocking up on booze. It's the holidays. Yeah. They're buying gifts. The um, ants are coming over. Yeah. The tequila. We're going to need tequila. The tequila loving ants are coming over. That's right. Um, <laughs> the teque- or the ant pacifying tequila. I, I don't have any of those, but. Yeah, um, that's a new one. <laughs> yeah. well, or, you know, it's just, it's kind of like how anyone talks about the holidays. It's just like, we're going to need a buffer. And I think that tequila lumped in with any liquor, you know, 
that buffer. So David's really feeling it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, you know how they talked about in, in the article that it can't be resold because of chain of custody issues. Um, Fieri or Fieri. I, I don't yeah, Fieri. Know. Yeah. Fieri. <laughs> uh, um, he said that he plans to put out a $10,000 reward for anyone who can recover that extra Añejo, which is that three and a half year aged tequila, probably just so he can drink it himself, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you know. Or, we worked yeah. really hard on this. Bring it back to me. Yeah, exactly. Like, please, just um, anything. Um, but anyway, I, what I did find interesting when I was looking into this is I found a report that detailed a crime that bear, bears a striking resemblance to this. This was a separate incident that took place at the end of 2023. Um, a company called Daytune Distributors, they're a North Carolina-based spirits company. Uh, they were gearing up for the launch of a uh, product called Hacienda Chactoon Tequila. They had 19,000 bottles of its uh, Reposado, um, and it mysteriously vanished after crossing the border. Oh. Uh, the CEO of the brand said criminals hacked the truck's GPS signal uh, while sending fake updates, allegedly including fake photos of traffic and a flat tire. The exact same thing. To the logistics the provider. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. Um, and so uh, it said here that criminals involved in the Santo hijacking um, perhaps emulated this technique. Um, maybe they were the same people. Yeah, uh, yeah hard to know, right? But, um, uh, you know, to Jeff's point, this stuff is going to continue to happen. And unfortunately, the more you read about it, you know, your point about the um, how bad it is for morale if yeah. you're a driver, and I agree with that, the more you read about it, too, the more I think people get the idea or they think, oh, well, look, this cool technique Yeah, yeah. that uh, day-tuned distributors uh, was victim to. I don't know. It's just like it's crazy how sophisticated this stuff gets and it kind of snowballs, you know. Yeah. So, um, More information that came out from the New York Times. Uh, so these were legitimate truck drivers. Yeah. Picked up the trucks at the warehouse in Laredo. At some point, these drivers received new orders from someone that they believed to be in charge of the delivery. They were told to go to a warehouse in Los Angeles because there were problems in Pennsylvania. That's what steered them there. The drivers left the tequila at a seemingly real warehouse in Los Angeles. And that was it. You know, the next time they mm -hmm. saw it, they found it and uh, people were pulling it off the truck. The final total right now stands at 24,240 bottles of tequila 240 of those bottles uh, were that extra Añejo single barrel um, that had been aged more than 36 months. I think 39 months was the final tally. And those are worth $120 a bottle. So, I mean, a $10,000 bounty just on getting those bottles. I mean, that's 30 grand in mm -hmm. uh, tequila right there. Um, I pulled out some of these quotes because I thought they were pretty cool. So Sammy Hagar says, quote, Guy and I are not the type to sit back and whine over spilled tequila. Our distillery is working hard or working day and night right now to replace as much stock as we can. Uh, President Dan Butkus said this heist was the strangest thing he had seen in 25 years in the spirits business. Man, what do you think he has seen so in 25 weird, years in the spirits weird business? Weird stuff. Just like, you know what? I got to tell you what, guys. This really takes the cake. It's yeah. crazy what I've seen. Um, but no, it is... Uh, I think the point here is that it, this it will likely happen again. But what do you do, Jeff, from a tech perspective? Is it more is it more disparate GPS signals? Like, do you not only are you lowjacking the truck, are you lowjacking multiple parts of the truck with different different GPS signals? Are you lowjacking the, the driver? Like, how do you get around well, it's, that? It's track and trace on the product, yeah. which is expensive and difficult and sort of also takes away from your processes that Anna alluded to where it's so traditional. And this is something we've been doing this way for 80 years. But when you have this much invested in a product to do something like that on the packaging, essentially, yeah. that the product, that's the next step. But again, we're looking at costs. And yeah. this is not a product that has mass distribution. This is very focused. Yeah. So that can be hard. Maybe not a chip a bottle. Maybe like a chip a pallet. But it doesn't even have to be a chip. I mean, yeah. really, we can do things with barcodes and, and things like that. So there are more effective ways of doing it that could help at least slow people down from yeah. doing this. At the end of the day, like one of the reasons, I mean, you can rip the label off and you're done too. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> no, it's, so um, it's, there, there, there are easy ways for the criminals to get around as well. I think you just want to put more things in place that make it harder for yeah. them to do this. Well, that's why I was thinking in terms of more 
more things that put off a signal at different parts of the um, of the shipment. That's why, and you know, again, if you're not uh, changing the labeling on each bottles, which again can be torn off, maybe it's just in one case in the entire pallet. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is, but uh, I mean, these companies are certainly going to start getting smarter if they're losing a million dollars at a clip. And uh, Anna, one thing uh, Guy Fieri said was that he believes Santo was targeted because they were having such an incredible year. Do you think that's true? Or, I mean, do you think people were like, Guy Fieri and Sam Hag- Sammy Hagar have to go down? Yeah, like I got to take those way. two down a peg or two? Mm-hmm. No, I don't think that's what happened. Yeah, just it's a crime of opportunity. Yeah. Right. You would think the government, Mexican government, would also want to step in here a little bit because with all the things that are going on with nearshoring and they really have a huge opportunity to allure a lot more of these bigger <clears> companies, <throat> again, this is a reoccurring theme here. You think they may want to get involved as well just to make people feel more comfortable operating in their country. Right. But this took place in Texas. I mean. True. Um, that, yeah, that's fair. Well, it is. I mean, that's I, I would like to learn a little bit more about that process as well, because mm-hmm. it was there's clearly a transition that happens. Right. So two truckers get them right across the border at a warehouse and then it becomes a U.S. shipment where new truckers come in uh, or new drivers come in. And there's like a complete reset. Um, I'd be more interested to know, like, if that's normal. Mm-hmm. You know, where as soon as a, a truck yeah. comes across the border, do they swap out? I don't know. All right. <clears throat> Our next most popular story. Local government won't help 4,000 illegal miners trapped in a closed mine. Some 4,000, some 4,000 illegal miners are trapped inside a closed South African mine. And the government has no plans to help, including denying access to food, water, and other essentials. Police closed off the entrances to the mine in Stillfontaine as part of the operation called, quote, close the hole. The tactic is designed to force the illegal miners to return to the surface and be arrested. In the past few weeks, more than a thousand miners have surfaced at various mines in the area, many weak, hungry, and sick. Illegal mining is common at old gold mines in South Africa. Miners go into these closed shafts to dig for any remaining deposits. They are often from other countries and part of larger organized crime rings. The illegal miners, which are typically heavily armed, have also been known to commit some pretty serious crimes in the area. The government won't help because everyone underground is involved in a criminal act. Instead, they hope to smoke them out. Anna, do the authorities have any other choice? Uh, you know, when I first read the headline of this story and then I read the story, I got something different than what I was expecting. You yeah. know, I think when you see that um, local government won't help 4,000 illegal miners trapped in closed mine. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a humanitarian crisis. It does. It sounds like these people are in a like a collapsed mine and they need aid and no one is doing that purposefully. Yeah. <laughs> that's really not what's happening here. Um, You know, uh, as you look at the details of this, it kind of makes sense. I think that um, this is perhaps the only real option to get this problem under control. Uh, First of all, um, you know, you kind of started down this road. Police are considering these miners to be very dangerous. Usually they're armed. Um, they're known to fight these violent turf battles among themselves. Yeah. They're sometimes committing crimes against the community in the region where they are. Um, so um, that's a huge problem. Um, and then they can and will apparently stay underground for months and months as long as supplies are being delivered to them. But um, since Operation Close the Hole began, police have arrested uh, the on-the-ground accomplices, they say. Okay. Um, and those that are trying to take supplies to these illegal miners. So they don't have a lot of options down there. Um, And uh, police say that since uh, this plan got underway, which was last December, um, just, you know, countrywide, uh, 14,000 illegal miners have been arrested Mm. and that $277,000 in cash and 1.8 million worth of uncut diamonds have been seized. Wow. Yeah. So, again, um, getting these miners uh, out by force is thought to be very dangerous. Um, And so they basically need to, as you said, they need to smoke them out through this deprivation technique, um, perhaps enough to be a deterrent uh, in the future, which I think would be important. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and for the record, uh, police seem to believe that this 4,000 plus number is inflated. They think it's more like four or 500 yeah. miners that are in there. Um, I don't know. I mean, I kind of don't see a, a way around this if you really want to solve this problem. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they can't really just let let these people continue to do this if they're terrorizing the communities around them. So, Well, and it's... Uh it's frankly dangerous for anyone that goes down there. And uh, I think that's part of the issue with going down there as well, is that when it's anywhere from 350 people in that mine to maybe 4,000, you have no idea what you're getting into. Right. And, 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 you know, they're not trapped. They can come out. They just know what's going to happen when they do. So. Yeah. And it's one point, the mine is one and a half miles deep. I mean, there's just a lot of real estate down there. And Jeff, you have to think that anyone that goes in to help, could potentially be used as a bargaining chip. Yeah, going in, not a good idea. Yeah. This is this is an interesting situation because it's one of those where it's much more complex than you'd think on the surface. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at South Africa in 1975, they were exporting 40% of the world's gold supply. Over the course of time, that's down to about 4% now. So this has been a catastrophic collapse of a key industry within this, this geography. So what you've got now is thousands of these deserted mines that basically still have gold in them, yeah. but not they're not profitable enough for the big mining companies to operate anymore. So there's this influx of illegal immigrants essentially coming from like Mozambique, Zimbabwe, into South Africa. They call them Zamazamas. Yeah, I saw that. Okay. And these these mines that we're talking about here, they're basically underground communities. Mm-hmm. There are levels and levels and levels. And they are, there was a very interesting uh, article BBC did on one of these individuals who he'll be down there for months at a time, but he brings enough gold out that he can sell, that he's taking care of his family, sending his kids to paid schools. They have a house, everything else that they mm-hmm. were able to acquire based on what he's doing down there, which is an illegal activity. Okay. Yeah. I'm not oh, yeah. sidestepping that in any way, shape or form, but it just feels like a situation where it's not really the miners that need to be dealt with. It's the organized crime syndicates that are running these mines and yeah. getting all of these illegal immigrants basically and throwing them into a hole to get gold. Yeah. That's the problem. So it's sort of, it feels like they're trying to just take a sort of almost put a bandaid over this and just make, try to make it go away and not, addressing the bigger issue here, Mm -hmm. which is you've got a bunch of individuals who are basically just gradually phased out with any, without any real input on what else to do or where else to go. So this is their alternative. There was no replacement for this, this industry or this sector or this way to make money. So this is what they're doing now. And again, looking at the miners and not helping the miners, again, I'm not saying being there to, to pamper them or anything else or going after them. But when they get out, it shouldn't be them fearing retribution from the government. It should be focusing on how we can help these folks get at the bigger problem here. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying give them a free pass in any way, shape, or form, but let's not deal with the miners. Let's deal with the crime syndicates. Let's deal with the mafia that's making this happen. Well, and to Anna's point, I mean, $1.4 million in materials getting pulled out of one area. I mean, so maybe the market's not there for large mining operations, but I mean, clearly- there's a market for, let's say, craft mining. You know, I mean, if the, I mean, the workforce is there. Well, that's what they talk about. This thing called artisanal mining. Oh, okay. the other thing that they're trying to sort of put a shine, a better light on what's going on here. But it's still illegal activity because they're trespassing in these mines and doing all these things you're not supposed to. But the South African government has not developed a process for that. OK, which is, again, part of the issue here. They're focused so much on all these illegal miners yeah. As opposed to the bigger issue that that's at play here, which is how do we find a different option for these folks to make money? And also, again, going after these huge crime syndicates. Yeah. It seems like there has to be a bridge between the two. Yeah. It can't be one or the other. There's something yeah. in the middle here. Well, and so at least one miner has died. On Saturday, uh, just this Saturday, actually, a judge ordered that the miners can finally be given supplies. Uh, the judge also told police that they have to stop blocking the exits. So volunteers immediately started lowering supplies, but police said, we're staying. We're not leaving. Um, The police also say that they allowed food and water so that the miners could regain their strength enough to get out of the mine. Yeah, Yeah. to get uh, get out of the mine. Um, Again, with that number discrepancy, if it is 4,000 people, what do you do if 4,000 people emerge from a mine and are suddenly arrested? I can't imagine that the local infrastructure can handle that. 
don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it is just a real mess. And uh, but I understand where you understand that it something has to be done and your hands are kind of tied. And yeah. It's just like, all right, we're just going to wait for him to come up. You can't send law enforcement into a mine where right. these people are armed and dangerous and have um, their own infrastructure really right yeah, yeah exactly you don't know where you're going down there it's a community as you said so um i agree that you know don't take it out on migrant workers that are just trying to pay the bills for their families but they have no way of differentiating between who's a good guy down there and who's a bad guy yeah, yeah. you know there's weapons I, I just i don't see a way beyond kind of just waiting them out here mm -hmm. let them come out and, you know, go from there. But yeah, unfortunately, not something that's easily unraveled. No. Uh, Going to be working on it for a while. All right. <clears throat> Our next most popular story. Hackers steal Major League Baseball's play Major League Baseball players Lamborghini by rerouting delivery. Last month, former Chicago Cub and current Colorado Rocky third baseman Chris Bryant was sitting at his home in Las Vegas, eagerly awaiting the delivery of his $300,000 Lamborghini Huracan. But it never came. Bryant was having the vehicle transported home for the off-season. The transport company Bryant hired was the victim of a, quote, business email compromise, a scheme in which hackers gain access to the company's system and quietly arrange the rerouting of the vehicle to another destination entirely. Investigators say the method, the method was so sophisticated that suspects have been able to arrange unauthorized transport of many vehicles nationwide. Bryant's Lambo was eventually found using license plate recognition cameras. Surprisingly, it was in Las Vegas, so it kind of got home. Authorities recovered the vehicle, and the perpetrators were sitting on a, quote, gold mine. Police found stolen vehicles, key fobs, fake registration documents, and technology and tools used to switch VIN numbers. Anna, two stories this week that we only see in movies. Maybe it's time for Hollywood to up its creative game, uh, especially if these types of schemes are getting so much easier. Yeah, so many heists this week. We have a Lambo heist, a tequila heist, and mm -hmm. really a diamond heist also, I mean, yeah. right? I mean, we yeah. had a cheese heist a couple we, weeks yep. ago. Recently had a cheese heist. Just yeah. so much theft. And... I mean, so it stands to reason that if you are relocating to your summer home in Las Vegas from your multi-million dollar career in Denver, just drive your Lambo home. Not if you're Chris Bryant. Mm -mm. He was, I, by the way, I did editorialize by saying he was eagerly awaiting it. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe he was just like, is it here? Was yeah. it here yet? Do I still have that? Yeah. He Where goes to his it? garage and he's yeah. like, what? Something had to have been there. <laughs> he's got a lot of money. Um, <clears throat> You know, of course, it's got people's attention because it's a famous person. Yeah. But I think the details here are pretty terrifying for any company that um, transports goods, mm -hmm. which for our audience is almost everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, looking into this, and I know Jeff mentioned before about like the frequency that this occurs in food and bev where you get stuff being stolen in the transit process. I looked at um, some other data to this company called Wistium. That's a firm that's, uh, they basically are set out to bring awareness to cybersecurity issues. And they did a recent report where they said that between um, July of 2023 and July of 2024, there were 27 publicly reported cyber incidents affecting organizations in the transport and logistics sector. And it was uh, second only to the manufacturing sector. So you can feel good about that. <laughs> Um, two important things to point out here. One, uh, these are just the ones that were publicly reported. Right. We know for a fact that um, a lot of companies like to keep these things under wraps, whether that be for reputational reasons or what have you. So we know that the problem is, of course, much bigger than this. Um, but two, uh, when these types of incidents include data loss, they're not just over just because we, you know, found the guy and the car got returned, you know, yeah. the, the fallout extends to customers, suppliers on and on, um, you know, with information in these systems that is now being exploited, sold. I mean, that information can be long gone. Um, so, uh, you know, in this case, yes, the, the hacker's goal was to steal that car, but you have to remember that anytime, a, a there's a security breach that, there's all kinds of stuff that comes along with that 
that just is, you know, out in the ether or what have you. So, um, so it's, yeah, it's a lot to think about, you know, it's, it's kind of like the story was like, uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit of a softball when you think like, oh, it's a person with a lot of money. They got a lot of cars. They lost their car for five days. They got it back. Like no harm done, but, um, but yes, harm done. I mean, anytime this happens, like there's harm being done and data being lost is always a bad thing. And, um, and it's, it's happening more and more as evidenced by our panel today that is covering this now twice in one week, basically of a, a vehicle being rerouted um, unbeknownst to the people behind the process that have a lot of money and a lot of data to lose. Well, and they, un- I mean, they uncovered a major luxury car theft ring. So, I mean, if anything, if it was the exposure of this being a crime against a major league baseball player, and as a result, some other people got some closure, maybe some vehicles back, if anything, at least it's good in that uh, sort of lens. For sure. They found, so the person that's accused of, of being the mastermind is actually a mechanic um, and had a Rolls Royce in their possession, yeah. um, several other vehicles, all this crazy stuff to the VIN, VIN swapping. And oh, I'm yeah. just like, wow. Um, <clears throat> I joked about this when you were putting the story together, but it just kind of is a grim look at when they remake gone in 60 seconds for the third or fourth time Mm -hmm. where it's not going to be this elaborate heist with people going out onto the streets to get the cars. It's going to just be a bunch of people like, Hey, did you download all that? And then hit send. And then the cars just pull themselves onto the shipping containers and it's over. Yep. Just, uh, it's just a three minute movie, three minute movie gone. And then you've got Nicholas cage. Who's the ethical hacker. Yeah, who used to be oh, you know, yeah, the guy stealing him that way. Now he's on the other side, so he's at the keyboard, like oh, trying to get yeah. you know combat all everything, all their attacks. Man, what was Roman Reigns? That's I think that was his name, Roman Reigns. No, no, that's the wrestler. Oh, it was something like I feel like it's close. You can't trick uh, trick Jeff with a wrestler. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what his name was in it. Memphis. I Memphis like, Reigns. Memphis Reigns. My bad. I got the wrong municipality. No. Um, <laughs> Rome, but Memphis. I like it's not. It's Real not close, math. Man. It's not math. Real so close. we're not going to hold you accountable. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. someone pull up a map, producer Eric. Can you pull up a map, please? I'm pretty sure they're next door. Um, <laughs> no, but I like that because then they could do it soon in his lifetime, and he can be on the other side. He could be there there like, "Hey, I've been there, man. I know what we're taking down." There you go. And I, uh, Anna, kind of mentioned this guy, but it, you know, I saw that this was. A three hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini stolen. I immediately thought it was not kids, but a younger group of people. This was the suspect is a fifty four year old Dot Viet Tu, a Vietnamese national who's living in Texas. I was, I guess, I don't know, for a lack of not really knowing anything about the story, I was surprised to see that a sixty year old man was behind this. That's what they're counting on. Yeah, and I, you know, I had to, and I'm not trying to vilify or embarrass the the logistics company that that got hacked here. They're the victim, okay. So I'm not trying to say that, but when they describe this as a sophisticated scheme, it's not. Yeah, business email compromise is not complicated, and that's what the hackers count on again, because I am sure that this company never thought they would be victim of a cyber crime. Mm-hmm. So therefore, they probably weren't doing a lot of the little things to defend against credential theft or phishing schemes in terms of training employees double factor authentication when you're logging in, all of these things that are sort of the blocking and tackling mm-hmm. of securing data, they probably weren't doing it. And again, it's not because they didn't care. It's because they probably thought, whose radar could we possibly be on to get hacked? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens throughout the industrial sector. Nobody thinks they're a big enough deal to draw the attention of hackers. And the reality is these guys who are going are going to go after the lowest hanging fruit. They're going to probe and they're going to probe and then they find a soft spot in whoever you are. It doesn't matter if you're Pepsi or if you're, you know, mom and pop down the road, they're going to hit you yeah. because they know it's going to have an impact. They know you're going to feel pressure to respond. And in this case, there wasn't any kind of ransomware or malware or anything like that. But in those instances, the reasons why those attacks continue to prolifer- proliferate and take place is because people pay and don't always rectify the problem. Yeah. Now, this was high enough profile. I guarantee that this company has got something in place now. They've got their employees trained up. They've got a response plan. They've got a lot of other things in motion, but it took this happening is the mm-hmm. unfortunate part of that. Part of the sort of double-edged sword of these incidents too is it's great to get the word out mm-hmm. because then it tells other people who are in a similar situation 
we need to take care of ourselves. We need to become more secure. We need to pay attention to all this data that's flying around and how people can manipulate and use it. The other part that's sort of dangerous is it also sort of provides that blueprint Mm -hmm. for other hackers and saying, wow, I never thought about this. This is a new thing that we can do, which is why we're always chasing the bad guys. Mm -hmm. But making their job as tough as possible is a big part of what we need to do. I was close. It's Randall Reigns. Nickname Men- Memphis. Okay, yeah. Randall Memphis, as his mom called him, yeah. Reigns. Um, <laughs> as his mom called him. Of course. How else do you get a name like that? <laughs> what I'm curious about, Jeff, is after something this like this happens, and you're doing the root cause analysis, you know, you're uh, having the postmortem, so to speak. Can you track it back to where the uh, the penetration was? Like, can you figure Depends. out the employee that's password was still password one, two, three, four? <laughs> I mean, if it's that basic, yes, yeah. you can. But I mean, that's where a lot of these conversations on things like endpoint security and and connection point protocols and, and secure by design and all that come into play. Because in a lot of cases, we're hooking this legacy stuff up to brand new technology. And that's where a soft spot can happen as well. A vulnerability can take place. So there's a lot of different things that we can look at. Depends upon the tools and the processes that you have in place. Okay. So. Well, Anna, to your point earlier, uh, Chris Bryant signed a seven-year, $182 million contract with the Rockies in 2022. $7 million signing bonus. So, I mean, maybe he didn't even notice. Just he might like, not have, yeah. Hey, one of, I feel like one of my cars isn't here. I mean, and I guess no one likes to see a vehicle stolen, but I think he's going to be okay. Yeah, no matter what happens, he's good. Yeah, the Lambo's home. That's what's most important. Um, A couple of other points of clarity. Um, It's since come out that so license plate tracking technology found the transport truck. And after they found the transport truck, then like at a nearby hotel or uh, like the desert inn or something like that, they found the car. And um, you had uh, mentioned some of the other cars. They also seized a 2024 Yukon Denali worth some $124,000. They found that Rolls Royce and it was just in the Palms Casino parking lot. They actually pulled surveillance surveillance footage that showed um, the 50 year old man and his accomplice unloading the car from a trailer and getting ready to sell it with um, fake VIN stickers and other documents. Yikes. It's kind of crazy because and you never know it. But I mean, they were just hiding these cars in plain sight. I mean, when you pan, pa- pass a car, you're not just you're just like. Well, right. That guy's compensating for something. You're not thinking. (laughs) Sorry, I totally stole my wife's line. That's anytime we pass an ass car. She's just like, someone's got bigger issues. Um, That is the PG version. Um, The four, the Rolls Royce was worth $400,000. And that was acquired uh, through identity theft and uh, reprogrammed with a new key fob. It's just, I don't know. I think uh, when you're spending money like this on vehicles, you just hope they're a little more secure. And they are just so vulnerable. Man. It's a wild thing. All right. <clears throat> Our next most popular story this week. Stanley Black & Decker expects $200 million hit from tariff hikes. Stanley Black & Decker is preparing to take a big hit from likely tariff hikes under the next presidential administration. In an SEC filing, The company said proposed increases could affect its pre-tax operating income by $200 million every year. That's about 12.5% of the company's projected 2025 operating income of about $1.6 billion. The estimate doesn't account for any moves the company's likely going to take to lessen the impact. We're talking about price hikes and supply chain changes. In the filing... The company said it is, quote, preparing to discuss potential price increases with its customers. Stanley Black & Decker president and CEO Donald Allen told analysts last month that the company has been preparing for this for months. However, the filing says any supply chain changes would likely take one to two years to make an impact. The company behind Craftsman, DeWalt's Cub Cadet, could also shift production from China to other Asian com- com- countries or Mexico, but they too might face tariffs. Allen says moving manufacturing to the U.S. would not be cost-effective and raised questions about whether or not the availability of labor in the U.S. would even be there in the first place. Jeff, we're already seeing companies plan for likely tariffs, and many say the answer isn't as simple as just moving manufacturing to the U.S., 
I mean, it's it's going to be complicated. I just I think that sometimes people see a, a simple problem solution and think that it'll cure all. You're hundred percent right. Um, and when we look at these tariffs, it's sort of like the cybersecurity parallel. It's not if you get hit, but when. Mm-hmm. And with these tariffs, if they go through, really in any way, shape, or form. It's not if prices will go up, it's how much. Yeah. I mean, this is going to happen. And in some instances, that's not terrible, in my opinion. There are some things, if we want to try to balance out our trade deficit, where we are going to have to take a hit and embrace that a little bit. The problem is when we try to do these universal approaches to everything. Mm-hmm. And we try to not just make an even playing field. We try to shift everything in our favor. Yeah, That doesn't work. Because we now operate in this global economy. Everybody has embraced this for all the benefits it offers in terms of getting into other markets and in terms of offering more competition, again, on a global level. So for people to think that by just raising these tariffs, we're going to have this massive job shift and everybody's going to come back to the U.S. and we'll sort of become this almost isolationist economy, that's just not practical thinking for a number of different reasons. When we look at the things that are going on right now and what President-elect Trump wants to do, especially with China, He's not wrong, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. to want to fix some of that. But leveraging a 60 to 80 percent or more Mm -hmm. universal tariff on everything is going to hurt a lot of people. What we need to do is really look at a lot of those state-owned companies from China or from other places in Asia and focus on some of what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Because they will flood the market with products at a loss because they see the bigger benefit for the country in terms of getting more product in there and what it's doing to hurt U.S. competitors. Right. That's an instance where tariffs can help. Doing it across the board creates a lot of issues, not only in the fact that it's going to drive prices up for U.S. consumers, but it's also going to create sort of these false wins where we see more contracts being obtained and we have to hire more workers potentially, but at the same time, those workers have less money to spend, so they're buying less stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this sort of circle of frustration that's going to take place because just because things are more expensive coming in, it's harder to import, doesn't mean that's going to spur this huge economic growth. Yeah. And I'm not the only one who's ever talked about this. If you ever want to go much more in depth, the people who are much smarter than me, you can look at the Tax Foundation. It's a bipartisan nonprofit group that attacked this very same concept of tariffs and the impact it has economically. Throughout history, it has never been the solution yeah. when it is applied on a universal fashion. There are ways to do it. We just can't go across the board because a company like um, Stanley Black and Decker here, they're not going to move from China. They're yeah. going to look to someplace else, whether it's Mexico. And when we talk about Mexico, I'm still confused there because last I checked, we have a free trade agreement with Mexico. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure how that's going to work or Vietnam or wherever else they're going to go to avoid China. Yeah. Again, there's places where it works. You can't do it across the board. It's sort of a flat tax, if you will. No, I, uh, I agree. The key part of everything you said is universal, right? I think it needs to be more targeted, uh, like yeah. certain industries that are under attack. And Don Allen actually said this, uh, the automotive industry, the semiconductor industry, those are two key ones that could use a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, and uh, one thing that did stand out to me a little bit here was that basically the company knew that this could it is a uh, likely outcome and has been talking about it for months, planning for it for weeks now. Um, do you believe them when they say it, it would take, what, two years or something? Uh, just I feel like that if you're planning on it for this long, that maybe you could have had a different solution in place rather than, yeah, no, everything's just going to cost more. No, I mean, they can only plan in so far as that they know that there's uncertainty ahead and that's what they were planning for, I think. Nothing could be determined for sure and still is not able to be determined at this point, um, you know. till Jan 1. Well, and, and until mm-hmm. until there's some legitimate, um, you know, specifics put yeah, down here yeah. because there's been a lot of talk, but nothing, you know, obviously, well, January 20th is the inauguration day. Day one, uh, we'll see if this gets covered right away in the first week. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But, you know, I think, Jeff, you know, you raised a lot of really good points, a lot that I agree with. I think whether anybody out there agrees with broadly applied tariffs or not, 
Um, I think it's fair to say that they're typically used as more of a bargaining chip, um, a means to an end. Uh, based on what President-elect Trump has been saying and his language around this, it sounds more like tariffs are the end game. Um, and I think no doubt there are many questions about how soon and how big those tariffs will be. Um, he proposed 60 to 100 percent on goods coming from China, 20 percent for goods from other countries. Um there are certainly some companies out there now that are already stockpiling supplies because mm -hmm. they believe they will get hit with these tariffs um, and whatever they need will cost them more if they wait until 2025 to, to buy them. Um, I think it's naive that uh, to believe that U.S. businesses and retailers will absorb the increased costs of these goods. Yeah. They won't. Um, yeah. We know that. It's a... Uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, reasonable to expect higher prices. Um, and um, again, so much is not determined at this point, but it is, I think, the, the writing on the wall. So, um, you know, you talk about reshoring and some of the implications here. Um, you know, I think that's the hope, mm -hmm. as you said, that more companies will be encouraged to bring maybe final assembly back to the U.S. It certainly could. However, there are a lot more um, less expensive places to do it. Uh, <laughs> you know, by way of an, ex an example, um, right after the election, uh, the apparel company, Steve Madden, I don't know if you guys saw this, they announced immediately uh, that they were going to move some production out of China. They were going to yeah. reduce their Chinese production by 45% to hedge against these tariffs that they were expecting. Um, that production will be replaced in places like Cambodia, mm -hmm. Vietnam, Mexico, and Brazil. They're not bringing jobs here. Um, that's not to say that we won't see anyone commit to reshoring to the U.S. That's certainly possible. But I don't think that it's likely. And I think what is most likely is, as Stanley Black and Decker's CEO is saying, they will raise prices. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, it's going to be uh, a, a challenge, I think, for consumers to absorb that. So um, we will see what happens. But I can understand why... Businesses are feeling a little bit nervous. Consumers are feeling a little bit nervous. And again, we will just have to see, you know, uh, we'll just have to see how it plays out specifically. And maybe there will be a lot of exemptions or mm -hmm. maybe the the numbers won't be as as high or maybe they won't be applied as unilaterally as we are expecting. But for now, I think it is reasonable to um, understand why some of these companies are you know, maybe pulling back a little bit, making some decisions about how to respond to this, which looks like it's coming down the pike. Well, I thought there was an interesting point too. And the guy from Black & Decker made this about there may not even be, if they wanted to bring jobs back here, they have a hard enough time filling them. We have right. this huge issue right now in terms of all these manufacturing jobs that are available. Great. Yeah. We're going to bring more manufacturing to the U.S., which is a on paper, a positive thing, but then we can't fill these jobs. Yeah. I was I was um, reading an article in USA Today. They're talking about a guy who does some metal fabrication, specifically with steel, and he was saying how he was excited about these tariffs because it was going to allow him to compete better with a lot of these low cost Chinese um, providers. And he thought he could double his workforce as a result of these tariffs. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking. How in the world how? is that going to work? First of all, how are you going to find another 120 people? Secondly, how are you going to pay them? Because these folks are going to need to be paid better because a lot of elements of their cost of living are potentially going to increase. Plus, this isn't like hiring people even two years ago. Rates are higher. It's mm -hmm. harder to find them. All of those things. So I think it's 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 one of those situations where people feel like, we're going to bring it all here and it'll yeah. be that much better without realizing we have embraced this globalization dynamic so strongly that it's just, that doesn't make sense. No, I completely agree. And according to NAM, uh, as of September, 2024, there were 481,000 manufacturing job openings two months ago, yeah. you know, likely only gone up And Anna, you had mentioned sort of this, uh, naive nature of these people. And I, I agree because some of the comments on the website, American tool brands should be made in America. Well, that's sure. Great. Uh, make these tools in the U S end of problem. No, that's not the end of the problem. I think it is that simplistic thinking yeah. that over simple, uh, simplification that is the reason we get into some of these messes. Well, I think what this could potentially lead to, and this is 
you know, three or four steps down. I understand that I'm probably jumping the line here a bit, but it, it's going to create a situation where cost could potentially become even more important, especially mm. in a field like when you're looking at Black & Decker with power tools, man, go to the go to the store. There are so many different options. Yeah. And granted, some of them are lower cost providers, but if they need to keep that price point, they're not going to be creating a higher quality tool yeah. to keep that price point, whether it's made in the U.S. or any place else. Yeah. If they increase their price, they know they're going to sell fewer tools. That's just the dynamic at play. So in the end, it's almost you're almost threatening a race to the bottom from a quality perspective because people are going to be so much more focused on price. Yep. We saw a little bit of this too, you know, another element of it. And you mentioned stockpiling, Anna, with when Trump during President Trump's first um, term in office, he did all that stuff with steel tariffs, which mm-hmm. everybody was very supportive of. And what it led to was initially a, a bunch of announcements over all these steel mills that were going to be reopened and there's more people coming in and creating all these jobs. Well, it never happened. Yeah. Part of that is because in order to fabricate steel, you need equipment that, guess what? Is made out of steel. <laughs> yeah. So you're buying all the steel still from different places. You need to bring it in and you're paying these huge prices so that you can make more. St- it doesn't work. It just yeah. doesn't work that way anymore. So um, so I listened to this incredible, it was a quick five minute interview with uh, Don Allen on Yahoo Finance. And these were just some of the points I pulled out of it. Um, one of them, Allen said that he's already talking to channel customers. Quote, on day one, when something is announced, we want to be doing pricing actions with our customers of some magnitude. Day one. Yeah. Uh, so that plan is in place. And uh, that's something that talk about the consumer uh, feeling it right away. Um, he says that we're living in a volatile world right now, but they're not going to do anything until or if something happens. So I think that's very indicative of almost an entire nation that's kind of in wait and see mode. Yeah. Um, Alan also said that, Quote, if I took our Chinese operation that we have today that makes power tools and brought it over in the U.S., the cost to make that product would be about 60% to 70% higher. That was just, okay, take this, move it here. What are you going to do? We're going to double prices. So, I mean, I I think that uh, this interview really showed some of the realities. And I mean, this is the head of the company just saying like, hey, we're with you. Here's what happens, you know, like uh, we're working on solutions. He said that they already, uh, you know, mentioned that they already have a significant operation in Mexico, which is a potential solution. Um, They've already started dialing back the work they do in China significantly, right? Eight years ago, 40% of what Stanley sold in the U.S. came from China. Now that's only 25%. And he says they're going to continue to lower it. So I wonder if at some point, you know, you could just be like, "Look look what we're doing as a company. All right. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, we're trying, we're trying mm-hmm. to get there. <clears throat> Don't kill us. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I do, even though I gave you about two and a half minutes of that five minute interview, I still highly recommend checking it out. Mm-hmm. Well, this topic is one we could spend this entire podcast going over the different elements of it. And I think we're all on the same page. It's not that we're opposed or I'm not opposed. Let's just be smarter about it. I, I agree. Well, and you mentioned, uh, I mean, it's not like I'm trying to make it a term, but uh, with shrinkflation, we also talked about skimflation and that's i mean that is the using of less and less uh quality materials and every like uh that's just the only other way to do it and i mean i don't know about either of you but i have purchased some of those bottom shelf tools previously and uh it's a risky gambit (laughs) you know especially when it's something like i don't know a uh, reciprocating saw uh my buddy. I know. I know. I learned a lesson. Okay. I learned a lesson. Not all blades are the same. Not all blades. <laughs> True. All right. Our most popular story this week was almost a no-brainer that it was our most popular story this week. <clears throat> a commercial jet flies nearly 300 hours with a tool stuck in its engine. A report from the Australian Transport Safety Bureau details an Airbus A380 that, starting in December 7th, 2023, flew 34 cycles with a tool in its engine after maintenance engineers forgot it. The Qantas Airways jet was in Los Angeles undergoing an inspection on the left outboard engine's intermediate pressure compressor. One of the engineers who had checked out the tool a four-foot nylon rod 
headed out early for a medical appointment, and left the remainder of the inspection to another engineer. When the work was finished, the subsequent inspections failed to see that the tool was still stuck in the engine compressor. Later that day, the aircraft departed L.A. for Melbourne. It flew 294 hours until its next scheduled maintenance check. That's when engineers found the tool, albeit severely deformed by now from the high-energy airflow. Uh, Luckily, the engine wasn't damaged and the aircraft didn't have any operational problems. Anna, it is wild to me how many safeguards can be in place to make sure tools aren't misplaced, and yet here we are, finding ourselves discussing another incident. I mean, at least this case was a near miss and not the aftermath of something a little bit more tragic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I read that the Australian Transport Safety Bureau said that uh, they later determined that the engineers who originally lost the tool in the engine forgot to report it. So they did, um, I think, discover that it ha- it was missing. Yeah, um, they just didn't do anything about it. No, I will. Uh, I so the uh, the ATSB reports are just as meaty as the NTSB reports. So I mean, you guys can cut me off in a minute, but I mean, I'm going to get into like, oh, okay, all gotcha. the different red flags <laughs> throughout this entire process. Well, I guess that point reinforced my first thought, which was, I wonder how often things get left behind and then are discovered and never reported. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, true. Just like, eh, maybe we'll just wait and see. Well, I mean, if you consider, I mean, we see this not, you know, I'm not saying that this is an exclusively a culture of a maintenance org for an airliner or whatever, but you see this everywhere. Uh, loyalty for your peers, uh, we cover for each other kind of environments. Like maybe you see it as like a no harm done, in which case, why would we report this to a regulatory agency kind of scenario? Maybe being commonplace. I don't know. Um, that aside, it seems like it, at least initially it was an honest mistake in in the sense that ASRB said that the investigation found that the maintenance engineers um, did do a boroscope inspection um, at the end. Um, and they just did not actually notice that the tool had been left behind, but they did conduct the inspection. Um, the, uh, the, I think the biggest problem that I saw there potentially was that, uh, the, the person who had initiated that, uh, procedure with the four foot tool, um, left in the middle of the inspection and um, a second person finished it up. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's something that you need to do about pro- like something about that procedurally, because that seems like it could be a way in for this type of error to take place. Um, if you're not the one who checks the tool out and somebody else is responsible for checking it back in, maybe that's where the disconnect was here. Um, and maybe that's just not suitable in terms of tool management. Um, it did seem like... Generally, they were trying to employ the practices that are required, but obviously a mistake occurred. And unfortunately, it just took a long time to discover it. It would have been nice if they would have said something yeah. <laughs> when they realized the tool was gone. I think that would have gone a long way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's one thing to cover for a coworker. It's one thing to, you know, not want anyone to get in trouble. Like, let's say that we had our lunch out there and you left a sandwich on there. Maybe you left your Snickers bar and you're like, I should probably be fine. We're talking like a four foot nylon rod in Mm -hmm. an engine. You got to just be like, oh, I know. I don't want you guys to get in trouble. I'm sorry. We should say something. I'm not saying that that's what happened here. I don't know for sure. I'm just saying that like you do see it a lot where it just makes you wonder, is there stuff that's happening behind the scenes that we never hear about? I think that happens. I think we could all safely say Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes, that happens everywhere. Because, I mean, that's also something that when you talk to anybody in any industry and you're just having a couple of drinks and you're just like, hey, let me tell you something off you, the record. Yeah, right. Like, you just, don't want to know what I know about yeah, that. Yeah. Hold on, I got to get something off my chest. You're not going to say anything, are you? All right. This is crazy. This is crazy, right? Yeah. You'll never believe what wound up in this vat of peanut butter. Uh Jeff, I have no idea why that was the first thing that came to my <laughs> yeah. mind. And I apologize for Maybe it. Maybe less universal next time. Yeah. God, I love peanut butter. Anyway. So when you look at this story, Jeff, I understand like uh, it's almost like there are too many responsible parties. And it's crazy to me that there are 
multiple engineers. I mean, in this case, there are four engineers. There's a support engineer. Um, the report that I'll get into in a little bit kind of blames the uh, the tool warehouse. Mm-hmm. That, uh, but to Anna's point, it is kind of wild that something like this can, even once it's discovered, still just kind of go under the radar. Yeah. And, you know, you always, I always lead to the culture dynamic, you know, if yeah. that's something that gets initiated and passed along and a that detriment potentially, thank God nothing bad happened here. But it also just feels like there's so many really simple solutions here, you mm-hmm. know, RFID tags and tools, you know, going through, I just remember some of my training when we first were um, disassembling and learning the M16 and basic training, we had a mat. Every part had a spot on the mat. So you learn to make sure you didn't miss anything. Same thing when we were in the motor pool and we were using tools or anything else, there was a spot for every single tool and everything we were using. And I know a lot of toolboxes have molds in them as well so that everything Mm -hmm. is accounted for. Mm -hmm. That's why we do that. It's not because we're that anal about everything. It's because we want to make sure everything's accounted for. We're not leaving stuff out of place. So those types of things, even, you know, you mentioned, Anna, the guy leaving in the middle of the inspection. If you're working with some sort of checklist, go like two boxes before. And mm-hmm. just start there as opposed mm-hmm. to trying to pick up right where you think the guy left off. These are all very simple things, but they can prevent situations like this, which, geez, I mean, what couldn't have happened? Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. kind of crazy to think. And again, there's just some pretty simple solutions out there. No, I uh, completely agree. And if you guys will humor me, I, I mean, again, I, this is like the abridged version of the report, but just so many red flags along the way. Um, so on uh, January 1st of this year, the aircraft returned to LAX uh, for maintenance, a three-day 3, d- three day scheduled maintenance check. That's when the missing tool was finally discovered in the left engine low-pressure compressor. The ATSB found that the tool was not located during the end-of-task foreign object inspections, which resulted uh, in it remaining in the engine. But basically, this person, uh, one of the workers was like, you get everything? And he went up there and hit it with the flashlight. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> uh, the Qantas air. Uh, so Qantas engineering lost tool procedure was not commenced prior to the aircraft being released to service. And the certifying engineer did not follow up on the lost tool prior to releasing the aircraft on uh, to service on March 4th. Uh, of this year, the executive manager for Qantas engineering released an internal safety directive. Uh, for immediate action that requires all employees to meet the company tooling control requirements without exception. I was just like, okay, just, uh, I believe that was probably the rule beforehand, but they're like, okay, now we all saw what could happen. Don't do it again. Like, uh, it was just, I mean, because really when you look at this situation, all the checks and balances were in place. They even flagged that the tool was missing. And so basically the only thing the engineering company could do was say, please do what you're supposed to, please. That's why it's all there. So this tool uh, was a one, 1.25 meter long nylon rod that was two and a half centimeters wide. It's known as a turning tool. Two aircraft maintenance engineers and a support engineer started the maintenance. Only one of these aircraft maintenance engineers knew what he was doing, was familiar with this boroscope uh, procedure. You want to guess which one went to the doctor? Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. The one that knew what he was doing. So the both parties that didn't know what they were doing, they were uh, kind of told by uh, their superior that they should leave everything there. And then the afternoon maintenance engineers, another two engineers were going to come wrap everything up, right? They got done, didn't kind of finish, left. So the second maintenance engineer who was on that first shift uh, his boss just said like, hey, if you could, they left already. So you're the only one still here. Go and get all the tooling out of there. And that's when he kind of like walked up and he was like, looks good. Looks good. Um, <laughs> so it, the report kind of blamed tool store personnel because it was the tool store personnel that conducted a daily scheduled tooling report. And the report identified that the turning tool was still unaccounted for. So they knew wow. the tooling report wasn't emailed to LAX, Mm -hmm. wasn't emailed to other service engineers, not the boss, not the managers, or tooling personnel at the time. Just like, hey, this is missing. Let's not tell anyone. It was just amazing to me to read 
how many people were involved, and it still just got so missed. It was wild to me. What do you? I yeah, mean, I mean, just call the next airport. <laughs> Be like, hey, can you just look in there? Well, that's that's the thing. It's like, I mean, at some point, just like, hey, you know, my bad. This place, this plane is gonna land. Maybe get someone to jump in there and yeah. look for this giant rod sticking out of the engine. I don't know. It was a, uh, and I mean, I understand it's not everyone's afternoon reading. But uh, it's just um, sometimes when you see step-by-step incompetence laid out so cleanly, it's like, and I mean, I guess, so part of this also was that maintenance started uh, when it was daylight out. And then after the second shift kind of wrapped up, um, it was dark out again. And then that's when they told the other inexperienced maintenance engineer to kind of go in there and make sure nothing was missed. And yeah, I mean, it has to be a little more sophisticated than just kind of throwing a flashlight in there. And it also like, how hard do you have to like go out of your, or how much do you have to go out of your way to not spot a four foot long rod? Like, yeah. that's a big missing piece. Big piece, Hannah. Yeah. All right. Anyway, it's, uh, hopefully if anything, <laughs> as the, uh, the internal memo so, uh, said, uh, hopefully they can, uh, continue to do all of their requirements without exception. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah that's a yeah. very David, David, that's good. That's, that's a good, good thing. You know, what's your way of putting it? Yeah, we should do that. Please do your job without <laughs> exception. Come on, guys. Come on. All right. Before we jump into, in case you missed it, story is not as popular on our websites like in.com and manufacturing.net. Uh, we have another word from our sponsor, Orkin. This week's episode is brought to you by Orkin. Do you feel like pests keep finding creative ways into your facility? Well, you're not imagining it. Even if you are careful about managing pests, these crafty creatures are always looking for holes in your defenses. So download Exclusion Basics, your first line of defense against pests, a new guide that gives you the best exclusion practices to keep pests outside your facility. If you're unfamiliar... Exclusion means repairing, sealing, shutting down common pest entry points. Download this guide now, and you're going to get six signs you might need exclusion services. All right. In case you missed it, stories... David, made... what about pets? <clears throat> I have never been so aware of the word pests in my life. Good Just call. like, don't <clears throat> say pets. Don't say pets. That's what was in my mind the entire time. I couldn't even tell you what I just read. Is there a is there a guide about what to do if you want pets inside your facility? Because I would read that one. Yeah, I, I think, would like some pets in here. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how upper management would feel about the. I mean, you know how office pets mm-hmm. are a thing now. Oh, okay. And it's just like no. I mean, even for me, that's a non-starter. I like the idea of dogs running around the office, but then at some point, I'm like, nah. Oh, okay. You know, I don't. I don't know. Do we had like office it is would... so dependent on the animal, which is why you can't make those like general policies. Yeah, you got. If we had like a golden retriever that wore a handkerchief and just like walked around in here, you would you would be against that. I wouldn't. No, I, but you can't say we can have an office golden retriever with a handkerchief tied around its neck. Mm-hmm. That's really nice to everybody. Yeah. No, I can say that. I just said that's, it. that's the only okay. pet that's allowed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, heard, I read a story about like a person that was hoarding mice. We could have apparently thousands of pet mice that could just be running around here. <laughs> I don't know. Keep them at the door. When I, producer Alex and I were working in the office during the COVID pandemic and nature kind of started taking back the office, it was kind of fun every once in a while when we found like tiny tree frogs and other really? little... Oh, yeah. Just what? Like, hey, do you notice the carpet jumping? And it's just like, oh, nope, those are frogs. And then we just, you know, we kept them in a little saucer with some like... Uh, Water. I mean, it was the pandemic. We were already pretty squirrely. This, but, yeah, this is a very strange story. I'm surprised I haven't told this to both of you. I feel no. like I have already confided this in you. And the Did fact that you were shocked. Yeah, were you like I leaving the doors open? I don't know. Oh, no. They were just, you know, I don't know how they got in squeezing mm. through the door or whatever. Squeezing mm. through the door. Okay. I Sounds guess. like some doors were left open. Yeah. No, no. It was not. It's, it's how like. Anytime you see uh, abandoned buildings and they're completely. This was not an abandoned building. Oh, it totally was. For like two years it was, it was abandoned. There's people in here like doors were locked. Yeah. But things was things were like 
kept up a little bit. Frogs were getting in. Nature Man. finds a way. Mm. It was Nature not. It's a way. Yeah. How it, long you been holding on to that one, Jeff Goldblum? <laughs> Nature finds a way. <laughs> All right. Uh, for in case you missed it this week, I'll start and I will talk about the importance of tree frogs as pets in the office. Uh, no, it's actually opposite. Um, AI was taught how to hear battery fires before they start. So slightly different. Researchers from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, have developed a new method that uses artificial intelligence to determine when a lithium-ion battery could catch fire. NIST reported that these fires produce a jet of flame that reaches up to 2,012 degrees Fahrenheit, nearly the heat of a blowtorch, in one second. Researchers noticed that the battery's safety valve breaks right before the fire. It makes this click hiss sound that kind of sounds like you're opening a bottle of soda. Lithium ion battery manufacturers designed the safety valve to break when internal pressure builds up and can no longer expand due to the battery's hard casing. Well, they used AI to train a machine learning <clears throat> algorithm to hear this specific sound and identify it. They recorded audio from 38 exploding batteries and modified the pitch and speed of the recordings to generate more than 1,000 unique audio samples, which they then used to train the software. The algorithm can accurately detect the sound of an overheating battery with 94% accuracy. Now, I picked this story because even though it had video of batteries exploding in giant flames, just no one cared. I was uh, shocked by how few people actually watched this one uh, or read this one. And I wanted to pick it because it is just a realistic problem that we have and a realistic solution for almost anything, anywhere you go. On airplanes, do you have any extra lithium batteries? Mm -hmm. uh, when I put batteries either in my basement or in the garage, man, if I had some sort of uh, detector that I could yeah. hear that and give you... Uh, so here's the other thing. The battery safety valve breaks about two minutes before a catastrophic failure. So we're talking about a two minute window now where you could either get rid of this battery, get it out of the house, do something about it, get it in some sort of explosive proof case, um, rather than fighting a fire that's as hot as a blowtorch within one second. And I think that would be an incredibly powerful and necessary tool. Yeah. The researchers applied for a patent, hope that uh, they can verify the warning time with more experiments on various batteries, and like I said, this technology could lead to a whole new fire alarm. And Anna, I mean, it's hard to not get behind additional safety for everybody. But what do you think of this story? Very cool. Um, and also envisioning what the test process was like, exploding a bunch of batteries over and over again and recording that sound. I mean, just crazy to think about. Yeah. Um, what what I didn't understand is so what kind of a product is it? Yeah. So uh, ideally, the product would be like a smoke alarm or it could be any sort of, uh, uh, you know, like a carbon monoxide alarm that would listen for this pop and hiss. But how would you know what it applies to? What do you mean? Like if you have a phone in your house and you have an EV in your garage and you have a. Oh, you know what I mean? how like, would you know which battery is going bad? Right. I don't know. I'm just it curious. Be, if, no, no, no. It would be good. At, like maybe if they could figure out some sort of directionality mm -hmm. or maybe you just know. Maybe it's one of those things where you've got to know, like, all right, in my garage, uh, the lithium batteries in there are power tools. Or if you have it in your bedroom, the lithium batteries in there are your phones. I don't know. Yeah. Like, uh, but I mean, you're right. That's the alarm starts going off and you just start heaving devices. I know. Alarm. Everything goes <laughs> out the window. Get them out. Um, not a criticism at all. Just a question. I'm just curious about this because it is a very um, interesting approach and you wish that they could apply this same, you know, obviously it's very specific to this pop hiss right but yeah. um if you could apply it to other things i mean what that if, also start on fire like i mean what if this pop hiss sensor or detector i mean depending on the size of the component what if you could put it in each individual tool you know what if this is something that is just put inside of your phone and if all of a sudden it starts making this sound yeah you know i mean that that's would be something a, that's yeah. realistic that would be amazing yeah, yeah. um jeff what were your thoughts on this? And did you get a chance to watch the video like of the test? I did not. This one was one of those that I like on Fridays. I catch up on everything. I yeah. wanted to look at on our yeah. sites, but I didn't get a chance. Well, I mean, you missed it. That's why <clears throat> this is here. Exactly. So 
the one thing that I, you know, in explaining why maybe it didn't get more attention, I think there's a little bit of AI fatigue going yeah. on right now. And I'm going to talk about AI as well. So <laughs> I get that. And I think that's, it's unfortunate because now we're missing, as opposed to these sort of grand schemes where we can use artificial intelligence, now we're starting to boil it down to really specific applications and really helpful things in our everyday life. It's no longer these grandiose ideas of it's going to build cities and this is how robotic intelligence takes shape. It's, hey, this is how we don't take something that's extremely useful and turn it into a, you know, fire ignition device. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So very interesting technology, especially when you put it in perspective of how hot those things and how quickly that takes place. Yeah. And you can just imagine that obviously the damage that would be done. These types of batteries, we're not going to be using lesser of them, fewer yeah. of them. So yeah, I think to Anna's point, once we understand how it's going to be applied, whether it's embedded within the device or some sort of proximity dynamic, whatever the case is, I could see this being sort of universally applied. Uh, the only reason I would um, ask people to watch this video and not just for the view, but because the battery is so small on the test um, stand that you don't even see the battery, but you do hear the pop and hiss and then it starts to smoke and you're like, oh, okay, because you're kind of like, when you hear something like 2000 degrees Fahrenheit in one second, you're like, ah, what is that? And then you see the violent nature of it happen and you're like, oh, that that's a real problem real fast. And it's just, I don't know, I found it very startling. You know, it doesn't matter how many runaway fire or runway, yeah, uh, thermal runway events I see. Uh, still always bad, still always shocking. <laughs> um, Anna, what's your in case you missed it this week? Uh, I selected a story that's about GE Aerospace and NASA partnering on flight tests to accelerate contrail understanding. Ooh. I know a lot of understanding that needs to be done there. <laughs> A lot True. of, lot of uh, conspiracy theories yeah. out there. Well, um, I know. I figured this one was going to be a hotbed of conspiracy theory. I know. I thought people would be interested in, in knowing a little bit more about what's happening here. So, it, okay. So, GE Aerospace and NASA, they're, um, they're going to take on a series of unique flight tests that are designed to help further the aviation industry's understanding of contrails um, using new test methods and technology. So, what they're going to do, um, well, before I get into that, we know what contrails are generally right it's just the you know what you're seeing behind the airplane it's basically ice particles um for when um airplanes uh fly through cold uh air that's also humid so um you know scientists believe that contrails uh have a warming effect on the climate so they're trying to figure out a little bit more about this and so what they're doing is um, NASA's Langley Research Center's G3 aircraft will follow a GE aerospace flying test bed in the sky and scan the aircraft wake using LIDAR, which is when light from a pulsated laser is used as a measurement tool. So um, NASA plans to generate 3D images of the contrails to better characterize how they form and then how they behave over time. Another very fascinating technology, I think, that shows how interconnected technology gains can be. I mean, LIDAR has been around for a really long time, but it's just in the past, I would say like two decades or so that we've really seen it applied um, in really significant ways in automotive, um, especially with mapping and things like that. Um, and so capabilities have improved a lot over the last two years. And so um, I just thought it was interesting that they were using LIDAR for this because, again, LIDAR is like, it's not new. No. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But because of all of the enterprise um, research that's being done in all these different applications, it's suddenly um, capable of this application that it never was. <laughs> so um, kind of exciting to see that. I will be interested to know what they say about contrails when they're done with <clears throat> this test. Something that some things they might say about them. Yeah. Uh, that they're used to spread barium, <laughs> aluminum, human plasma. I haven't heard that one before. Why? Why, why would we be spreading Cut. these things? Cut. Spreading <laughs> COVID-19 infections. <clears throat> Ooh. Oh. Involuntary wow. vaccines. Now you ask why, Jeff? Well, weather manipulation. Yep. Oh. I knew about that one. Population control. Oh. Spreading pandemics. And finally, psychological influence of the masses. Chemtrails. Right. What are they for? <laughs> uh, I think that's what they're going to discover. All the things you just said, man. But they just, just want to confirm. You know, it'll just it'll be the opposite of like the U the UFO hearings that they had, mm -hmm. where everyone's just like, "We're going to finally hear about aliens." Uh, the the opposite. They'll be like, "Oh, you, we looked into uh, chemtrails. <sighs> they're doing all of that." Yeah. <laughs> 
All of it. Then this entire time, you guys were right. Yeah. Internet. <laughs> yeah. The reason that podcasts exploded was because we were spreading barium in an effort to get people on the podcast platform. Yep. Uh, Jeff, any science that they can use to wrap around a better understanding of something that is, I guess, weaponized for misinformation? Good. <laughs> <laughs> right? Good. No, the, you mentioned about LiDAR. That's kind of what caught my attention here, too, in terms of a different application for it. Because we do, we have had it for a long time, and you typically think about autonomous um, warehouse robots or obviously autonomous vehicles, things like that. So using it here to capture this information and understanding how sort of this compound is formed and, and all that. I mean, you could see this going into a lot of different areas too and influencing a lot of different sort of focal points of study. I love that the experiment is called the <clears throat> Codex, the Contrail Optical Depth Experiment, the Codex. <laughs> yeah. Have you launched the Codex today, Jeff? <laughs> Just, yes! All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's your in case you missed it this week, Jeff? Oh, I went on the AI trail as well, but from a little bit different perspective here. Um, my, in case you missed it, is Homeland Security Department is releasing a framework for using AI in critical infrastructure. So the Biden administration released guidelines for using AI in the power grid, water system, air travel network, maybe contrails, mm -hmm. you know, and other pieces of critical infrastructure. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas told reporters that we intend the framework to be, frankly, a living document and to change as developments in the industry change as well. This one caught my eye because right now infrastructure is the biggest industrial target right now for hackers. Mm -hmm. They're getting into a lot of these wastewater treatment systems. They're getting into electrical grids and just kind of trying to see what they can do. We haven't had anything major hit us yet. Doesn't mean it couldn't. Especially Not when you see- close. Especially when you see all the state-sponsored actors that are getting into this sector. And a lot of the reasons that it's so vulnerable is because you've got a lot of small municipalities who don't have the training, don't have the resources financially to combat a lot of these attacks, to put the necessary systems and tools in place to fend off these hackers. AI could really be a bridge for that. AI is not an expensive platform necessarily to implement when you're looking at software that is going to be able to probe your own system and say, this is out of line. This doesn't yeah. look right. We're getting some weird readings here. You should check this out. And there's enough resources within these municipalities to at least know that shouldn't be that high. Those chlorine levels should be lower or the pressure level is too high. We're overloading the grid, whatever the case may be, and make those adjustments before the hackers do what they need to do. So I think this is a really exciting dynamic here. A framework, again, is not a policy. It's not a strategy. It's basically just saying, Here's some steps you can take to start developing your plan for implementing AI and strengthening your overall cybersecurity framework or your cybersecurity plans to combat these hackers and what they're doing. So I thought it was a really interesting um, dynamic there and a very positive step forward that affects everybody because a lot of things that happen within these infrastructure networks, there are industrial control systems that are also utilized by manufacturing. Yeah. So if there's a blueprint here in the infrastructure sector, they can emulate that and use that to attack manufacturers. So having something here that we can build off of, I think is great. It's got government support. CISA, I, I mean, does anybody who's listened to this know I'm not a huge uh, government, big government fan or bureaucrat fan, but CISA has done some amazing work, which actually leads into the other thing I just wanted to mention, um, not being the biggest fan of bureaucrats, we're actually losing a really good one on inauguration day. Her name is Jen Easterly. She is the director of CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Mm -hmm. um, she is stepping down on inauguration day, mm. as are all of the other CISA appointments from Biden, from mm. President Biden. And the reason I want to call her out is specifically she has been huge in developing the secure by design protocols that are put in place. So any of that embedded software, connecting all that new technology to legacy um, equipment, that's her. Mm. She's trying to put a lot of different protocols in place to help manufacturers and the industrial, the entire industrial sector make sure they're not screwing anything up and mm -hmm. keeping it secure when they do all these things. She's also done a lot in terms of publishing these vulnerabilities that come out for the industrial control systems so people are aware, hey, this is a soft spot. Mm. Make sure you're covering this. Whether you're working with Rockwell or Siemens or whoever your provider is, you know, they were always very uh, ambiguous, they, you know, in terms of providing all that information. So Jen Easterly has done an amazing job, and um, I'm sure the Trump administration will appoint somebody just as good. But we're, uh, yeah, we're losing a good one there. Has uh, potential appointments for that department or that agency 
been named yet? So CISA falls under Homeland Security. Okay. So that's um that's Governor Nome, I okay. believe, who was appointed Department Secretary of Homeland Security. So she'll appoint the new director of CISA. Good. So all right. Um well, and I don't know if you had a chance to check this out. Oh, well, Jeff, one thing I was curious about is that so a lot of times when I hear about employing AI as a safeguard, sometimes I think about how easy it might be to weaponize AI against AI. Sure. I mean, that has to be a realistic vulnerability. How do you employ a tool like AI and then also make it so it can kind of stand up against other AI? When- well, it's an ongoing battle because yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. So who's going to weaponize it first? Well, the bad guys are. They're, yeah. they're way ahead of us there. But having something in place that, again, just makes it that much tougher and yeah. can at least get the the low-hanging fruit and take care of that first and then sort of move up the food chain, if you will. I mean, that's what this is going to allow some of these smaller municipalities to do in a much more cost-effective and less resource-intensive way. Um, and uh, stories like this always jump out because you hear those stories about infrastructure that's attacked. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, PLCs at a water plant that are putting – uh, hazardous levels of chemicals into the water, but because they were hacked, it makes it look like everything's operating uh, status quo. Anything that can be used to protect this, I feel like is a no doubt, a no brainer. Yeah, for sure. And I think it definitely goes back to a point that you made earlier, Jeff, which is let's not look at AI like this uh, technology that's going to take over humanity and steal everyone's jobs. Like, Right now, there's so much opportunity for right. using AI uh, to be a complete game changer for stuff like this. Stuff that we've had trouble for many years getting our arms around, which is infrastructure and just the scale of that and how to manage that stuff that is very vulnerable. And um, to have AI in our corner as a way of monitoring uh, some of the, those uh, key systems, I think that's incredible. So, yes, a very positive story, in my opinion, even if you're not a huge fan of the potential implications <laughs> of AI in general, mm-hmm. um, you got to look at this as a win, in my opinion. We we'll get into that later. <laughs> um, well, before we get out of here. Do you want to talk about chemtrails after the podcast? Um, <laughs> just uh, give David a call <laughs> and uh, AI taking over no. humanity, the, all of those things. Not a, uh, Email, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> before we get out of here, let's jump into our final thoughts for the week. Anna, what's your final thought this week? Uh, so this week, um, my daughter's fourth grade class was asked to talk to a relative about a food that they make in their family that is um, very important to their culture. And my daughter selected um, this pink jello that my mom makes <laughs> on Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's made of pink jello, strawberries, and Cool Whip. And then she serves it in this very fancy like glass bowl. Is it fluff? Fluff? Yeah, it's fluffy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is my daughter's like favorite thing on earth. And so it's become something that my mom now serves at every holiday meal (laughs) just for, just for my daughter. But she doesn't know that. I think she thinks it's like a very important family recipe. Yeah. So she wrote it all down and she's presenting it to her class and I thought it was sweet. But anyway, so Thanksgiving's coming up, um, and we'll get to have it. Yeah. Uh, this very important recipe to our family, um, that is indicative of our culture. Uh, <laughs> yes. pink, pink, fluff. pink jello fluff <laughs> yeah no i mean i think to that point though it just kind of uh reinforces the importance of any family traditions it doesn't you know? matter what it is right yeah, yeah it's important for her and um and the fact that grandma makes it and we're all together yeah, so, it, was, yeah. it reminds me of do you remember that salad that was um a thing for a moment where it was like grapes and snickers bars Oh, no. In like, uh, it was like, just, I just remembered seeing it at family outings. I'm like, just because there are grapes in this, <laughs> do not confuse that yeah. this is terrible. We don't me. need to call it a salad, though. Yeah. If it's 50 50 grapes to <laughs> Snickers bars uh, mixed with Cool Whip. <laughs> yeah. Salad's being used loosely. I don't know the entire Sounds kind of good, actually. <laughs> I don't know the entire recipe. I'll find it and post it to Blue Sky. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no. So, uh, my final thought this week was, you know, right before this, we, uh, as an office, all had pizza and it was kind of nice to just kind of get in the conference room and hang out for a minute and enjoy each other's company. I mean, it was great that that was catered in because we had our, you know, first snowstorm of the uh, year, which was sticking, but many more to come. Yeah. Um, actually at the same time, a, uh, a podcast listener reached out, uh, because, you know, I always like to say that, you know, if you're doing cool things at your company, you know, we like yeah. to hear about it. And they're actually having a company potluck today. 
uh, and just sent a photo of these three huge tables lined up all covered in crock pots. And uh, he made uh, venison meatballs with a homemade barbecue sauce. Very impressive. Very impressive. But I don't know. It was just a reminder that uh, when we get so caught up in the hustle of every day, it's good to just take a moment and enjoy each other's company, whether that's uh, getting a dozen pizzas for six people or whatever the math is in the office. I think so we had 15, 16 people today. So I think that means we ordered 38 pizzas. (laughs) Um, but, or, you know, something that's a little more personal, like a potluck where everyone kind of, uh, does something special from, uh, their own list of recipes. I think it's important. And, uh, I think it's good in terms of company morale and, um, just building a positive company culture. So if you haven't done that in a while, maybe give it a think, do it next week because people aren't working that hard next week anyways, except us, except us. Oh, and podcast note. We are recording the podcast live on Tuesday. So if you catch us live, you'll catch us live on Tuesday. Uh, it'll still go out normally as it does every Monday. Jeff, so final you, thoughts. Was that kind of a passive aggressive call out because I was not in the conference room eating pizza with you guys? <clears throat> I was, no, I, was I didn't want it to seem like so like exclusionary. It was just, I didn't want to be like everyone was in the office except Jeff. Jeff and producer Alex because mm-hmm. they're too cool. Too busy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it's true. <laughs> um, it's funny because like I was actually going to bring up a food thing as well so kind oh. of a common theme here no it was interesting you talked about things important to your family culture and not necessarily that we had that deep of a dive on it but my all my daughters were home for supper Saturday night which is like just doesn't happen anymore so it was cool that the five of us were actually there to eat and the girls coming home from uh, from school it was my youngest daughter's birthday so I asked her if she wanted me to make something or we could go out or whatever she wanted and she wanted me to cook and she asked if we could either have beef stew or spaghetti. Mm. Aww. So I made both. Yeah. So we had, we had the crock pots going as well. And my uh, my middle daughter wasn't feeling well, so she asked for a certain type of soup as well. So I made some chicken chili. Yeah. So we had we had lots of food going. It was kind Saturday of a um, sounds amazing. Still some leftovers. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was a cool cool moment. The other thing I'd like to say is we've had a couple of listeners, watchers talk about my microphone here being upside down. <laughs> We'll get there. We yeah. are aware. Sorry if it's frustrating to look at. We know it's upside down. We'll we'll get there. Do so. you know what it takes to get that thing turned around? I don't. Bananas. I'm putting the pressure on all of our wonderful producers over there, and they're on it. Yeah. I'm sure they'll take it well. They seem so. concerned. Yep. Very. I, they both told me I was number one right now. So Laser Number eyes. one? They said I was number one. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> on their list. No. <laughs> they just held up number one finger. Hmm. Top priority. Um, we'll talk about that later. Before we get out of here, uh, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, if you'd uh, like to email the podcast, uh, offer Jeff your own personalized number one. Uh, you can reach him <laughs> at Jeff at IN.com or David or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can subscribe to our daily newsletters. Make sure you get them delivered to your inbox first. Or you could uh, subscribe on YouTube at IEN Magazine so you can join us live every Thursday, except next week, which will be Tuesday. Uh, Join us for the live taping. All right. For Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells, I'm David Manti. This is the Today Manufacturing Podcast, and we will see you next week.